All right. So first things first, um, I want to, uh, to to thank everybody who's here, everybody who's going to watch the recording of this. Um, one of the reasons I um, have been trying to run a reading series is that, um, you know, I think we can all agree that there are so many challenges in bringing our work in front of an audience. And um, I don't know about other folk, but, uh, you know, in the, the years I've been working in, in the writing field, whether it be at the university or as, a, as a, an author myself, um, one of the kinds of experiences that has always given me the biggest connection with other authors and their work has always been uh, the live readings that I've attended, whether they be in person or virtually. I think there's just no replacement for um, being able to hear someone present their work, uh, especially live whenever possible. But, um, you know, our own voices as authors, I think, are really important to us. Um, I think it matters to us for them to be heard. And um, I think it just adds um, a texture to our work and um, helps connect our faces to um, the stuff that we're presenting. Um, and so, um, you know, I, I think um, in the since I've been involved in the uh, the small press and indie horror scene, I've seen very few live events, even at a lot of the conventions that I've kind of come across and seen their scheduling. Um, I haven't seen a whole lot of readings. And so I'm hoping that, um, you know, I can fill a bit of that void that the authors who are part of the series can fill a little bit of that void. And so um for tonight, of course, um, I'm about to introduce our authors, but I will take just one moment to uh, mention that we do have one more of these readings scheduled for January with the authors um, John Kahn, uh, Duncan Ralston, and Jeff Strand. Um, so that's the uh, the next event in the sequence. Um, and after that, um, you know, I'm hoping to do at least two more of these and then, um, and then go from there. So uh, without further ado, um, for tonight, we have outstanding readers who have been absolutely gracious enough to join us. And so um, our uh, readers tonight are going to be Megan Stockton, Joe Scipione, and Jay Bauer. Um, Megan is going to be um, reading from her forthcoming novel, Lovely, Dark, and Deep, um, which I do believe this is... Um, the first um, non-Patreon presentation of the book, if I'm correct. Mm, yes. uh, so I'm really excited about that. Um, and uh, otherwise, though, uh, Megan is also the um, outstanding author of Blue Jay. If you haven't checked it out, it is 100% worth reading. Um, it's a fairly concise and well-crafted and a very well-crafted book. And I think uh, anybody would have uh, one hell of a night reading through it. Um, otherwise, as well, I do want to take a moment to mention that Megan has been absolutely incredible for the indie horror scene and is organizing um, a uh, convention in Knoxville for next year called uh, TV Archon, which um, I am tremendously excited to uh, to be part of. And uh, I, I really hope lots of folk um, hear about this one. All right. So without further ado, I'm going to turn uh, turn it over to Megan Stockton. Thank you. I'm going to read the first three chapters of this. Uh, and each chapter is a different point of view. So I'll say the chapter name and the uh, character that it's uh, following. Uh, so chapter one, Fisher. The bloated corpse was covered in crystals. From the distance, he couldn't tell if the chunky layer of glitter across the body was caused by sea salt or sand. It could have been either, he supposed. He marveled at how it looked as though the stomach had popped open just at the man's hip. Despite this rupture of tissue, the man's stomach remained swollen with the girth of a nine months pregnant mother to be. He was mostly naked, but was missing any private parts, a bruised and mangled doll. Fisher struggled to hide behind the sparse beach grass, chin dragging into the sand as the army crawled onto the crest of the small dune to get a better look. If he stared long enough, he thought he could see the corpse breathing. The sheriff stood there with her tie whipping in the wind, fluttering across her shoulder like a scarf as she studied the body from a proximity that made Fisher jealous. It wasn't that he wanted to see a dead body. Did anybody want to see a dead body? He couldn't help his curiosity, but isn't that what killed the cat? When she turned around, Fisher quickly ducked down again. The approaching whoop of a siren blared and Fisher ventured another look to see the side-by-side -side coming up the boardwalk. The top of the vehicle rattled as it bounced along the uneven wooden planks, most entirely buried underneath an inch or more of sand. The sheriff turned away from the body and went to meet the deputy in, in the cart. A voice came from behind Fisher, startling him so badly that he dipped his nose into the hill of sand. Fisher, where are you, buddy? 
Scooting backwards on his belly, Fisher slid down the dune and began sprinting across the beach towards his father's voice. A sagging boat dock held tight to the rope of a small boat, and his father was standing with his hands on the railing as he leaned over the blue-green water. Fisher's father was his favorite person. His mother had always told him that from the moment he was born, he only had eyes for his father. He was a daddy's boy through and through. The sea foam just reached the edges of his feet as he walked along the wet, packed sand. Fisher felt like he belonged to the ocean. He didn't know how to explain it, but when he was on the beach or out in the water, he felt like everything was aligned just as it should be. Where'd you run off to? His dad asked, running a piece of sandpaper across the uneven surface of the railing. He leaned down and closed one eye, curled hair falling over half of his face. Fisher walked to the end of the dock and plopped down, feet dangling over the water's surface. The sheriff's looking at a body on the beach over there. A body of what? Like a dead person body. Somebody that's dead and washed up on the uh, washed up on the shore. It's all sparkles. Sparkles, huh? His dad responded, voice casual. He didn't even look over at him when he talked. His hands continued to slide across the railing, sandpaper making a satisfying noise. Fisher thought that if he kept sanding it, there'd be no rail left at all. Don't you believe me? Didn't you hear the siren? Sirens. The single word left his father's lips, followed by a sigh. He tossed the sandpaper down onto the floor of the boat and hopped onto the dock. He sat down beside Fisher so heavily that the old wood groaned underneath him. Fisher wanted to ask if his dad was even listening to him, but he knew better than to start an argument, not since he didn't get to see him much anymore. He would spend all the time he could, every minute. He didn't care if they didn't talk at all, although he did wish that he could still go get ice cream with him, watch movies about dragons and knights and faraway lands, or play chess on the kitchen table every night before bed. How's your mom, Minnow? His father asked quietly, looking over the water. Good, I guess. Does she still talk about me? Fisher looked over at his dad, who had set his hopeful eyes upon his son. Fisher sighed, swinging his legs above the water. Yeah, all the time. Chapter 2. Lyra. Today was an absolute shit show. Every October, Lyra had to prepare for the evacuation of the entire island. Some years it was worse than others, and this year was one of the years that was far worse. If the weather predictions were accurate, this was going to be one of those storms of a lifetime. Lyra always took the predictions with a grain of salt, but she still wanted to be prepared. She liked being prepared, knowing what was coming, having a plan. She liked smooth sailing. And everything was smooth sailing until she got a call about a body that had washed up on South Beach. There wasn't much activity on that part of the island. A few private docks and small houses. That was it. Sometimes kids traversed the rocky and unmaintained beach, fortified by cliffs, and partied on the shore. Occasionally, one of them would fall and get injured, or they'd get lost in the night without cell signal, and Lyra would have to retrieve them in the, ne the next day. The island was small enough that everybody knew everybody, but Lyra didn't recognize the dead man on the beach in front of her. Her only deputy, Landon, was squatting down to get a closer look at the man's face, pushing the corpse's matted hair back with his ink pen. No wallet, no identification. I don't recognize him, do you? Lyra crossed her arms over her chest as she continued to lean to the side. Landon stood up, knees cracking audibly as he hobbled to stand beside her. No, nah, I don't know him. Do you want me to bag him up? Yeah, we'll need to call the funeral home and make sure they can hang on to him until after the storm. Can you handle that for me? Yeah, of course. Landon smiled and paused before continuing. Say, what are you doing when you get onto the mainland? Are you staying with somebody? I mean... I, di I didn't mean that to sound nosy. I didn't mean it like that. What I meant is, where are you staying? Like, Lyra laughed at him, patting, putting her hand onto his shoulder to give him a small squeeze. It was no secret that Landon had a crush on her. Everyone knew it. He was sweet, a good kid that was a hard worker and seemed genuine and kind-hearted, though he was likely at least 15 years younger than her. Lyra was a generous way into her 40s, and Landon might have been pushing 30. He knew he was barking up the wrong tree, so to speak, but he didn't seem to care. Not only that, but Lyra just wasn't ready for another relationship, not since things had gone south with Felix. It was the quietest and most casual breakup, but somehow had left something so irreparable in her. She started to answer him, but her phone buzzed. She was surprised by the vibration because it was next to impossible to get a signal down here. She put the phone to her ear and said, Sheriff Hirsch? The connection was shitty. Even as Lyra jogged up the pathway through the dense sand to get to the boardwalk, she could barely hear what the woman on the other end of the line was saying. She hadn't checked to see who was ca calling, but she realized it wasn't her dispatcher. It was a young woman named Barbara. I need you to come here now, Lyra. My baby's gone. Jesus Christ, someone's taking him straight out of his crib. He is gone. 
calm down, Barbara. I'm on my way. Just hold tight. Lyra yelled into the receiver as though some volume would somehow make, make it through the lack of service. She hung the phone up and slipped it into her pocket. Landon, we gotta go, she called, jogging back down to where Landon was zipping the man up into a black cadaver pouch and rolling him onto a bodyboard. What's up, he asked, panting. His ears and cheeks were flushed from the effort of bagging the body alone. Barbara Todd said her baby's missing. At least, I think that's what she was saying. It doesn't matter. It's urgent, so let's get going. Barbara's family had lived on the island for decades, and her husband had been one of the men who disappeared a couple of years ago during a fishing trip. Five men had gone out on Saturday, slated to return by Wednesday, and they never came back. No remains were located. The boat was never found. It had shaken the island community to its core. Those women still met once a, once a month for a support group at the church. While all of the women struggled with the lack of real closure and the sudden unexpected loss of their loved ones, everyone kind of agreed that Barbara had lost it after the incident. But the real surprise came when she was pregnant last year. No one knew who the father was, literally no one. Lyra and Landon loaded John Doe into the back of the UTV, his stiff form hanging off of one side. Landon strapped him down and then jumped onto the driver's seat, spinning tires and slinging sand as the vehicle lurched up the sandy bank and onto the highway. They rode in silence for most of the drive. The engine of the UTV was a little obnoxious anyway, which made conversation a yelling match by default. It wasn't until they were turning into the driveway that Landon tried to talk to her again. So about earlier, I was just wondering what your plans were. I know that the weather's bad, but I was thinking maybe if you wanted to see a movie or... Lyra had heard everything he said, but kept her eyes straight ahead. When he stole a glance over at her, she returned the glance and then raised her eyebrows in surprise. Oh, I'm sorry, she yelled with an apologetic smile. Did you say something? I didn't hear you. Landon's cheeks flushed and he shook his head. Nah, nothing. He pulled the vehicle into Barbara's driveway and added, I'll go drop this guy off and swing back by to get you unless you need me to stay. His words lilted up in pitch as though he were inquiring. She smiled and hopped out of the vehicle. That's fine. See you in a bit. Landon waved and then backed out of the driveway. She stood there until the engine was a gentle hum in the distance, just before she took a deep breath and re approached the front door. Lyra had raised her hand to knock, but before her knuckles could wrap against the wood, the door swung open. Barbara stood there, little more than tear-streaked cheeks and frizzy hair. I saw you, she whispered, eyes filled with tears as she stared somewhere beyond where Lyra stood. I saw you. Barbara? Lyra said her name, voice low and quiet. Barbara blinked once, tears racing down her cheek and into her parted lips. Lyra reached out slowly, clasping the woman's soft hands in hers. At the contact, Barbara began shaking, and her eyes drifted to Lyra's. He's gone. My baby's gone. I can't find him anywhere. I just, I don't understand. Let's just sit down for a second, okay? I want to talk first. Barbara nodded, the motion jerky and unnatural. Lyra hadn't been inside Barbara's house before, or if she had, she'd forgotten about it. The interior reminded her of the 50s. Even the appliances looked dated. The only thing that didn't seem to match the rest of the decor was a set of stiff wicker furniture with firm cushions in the living room. She seated herself on one side of the couch and Lyra chose to sit beside her instead of in the chair across the room. Where was the baby, Barbara? Lyra asked, keeping her tone calm and quiet. A missing baby wasn't good. There wasn't a scenario where this was good. There wasn't a scenario where this was even neutral. You didn't misplace an infant, and babies didn't lie quietly anywhere. Dead babies were quiet. The concern that Lyra kept stifling was that Barbara had done something to it. Whether it was intentional or accidental, she didn't know. As unstable as Barbara had been after the disappearance of her husband, Lyra wondered if postpartum depression had compounded and exacerbated her fragile mental state. He was in the bassinet, she started quietly. I could smell the storm coming in, you know, the moisture, that smell, the little bit of electricity in the air, the little tingle. I opened the window next to the bassinet so when he slept, he could smell the storm too. He had been a little fussy today. Her voice droned off, falling into silence. Fussy babies can be hard, Lyra added supportively. I'm sure that must have been frustrating for you. <clears throat> Not really. I just wanted to get him to feel better. He had been pulling at his ear, but I gave him a bottle and he fell asleep and I put him in his room. He never made a peep, even when it took him. When what? Lyra said. Something had to have taken him, not somebody, though. It was too quiet. Whatever it was kept him asleep somehow. Lyra was uneasy. Her eyes flicked to the window that faced the driveway, watching for Landon's return. In the distance, she could see the darkening clouds and was reminded of the incoming storm, the time crunch to get everyone off the island before they were stuck for the next several days in what might be the worst storm the island had seen in several years. Can you show me his room? Lyra asked, standing as though to suggest it was, she was only asking to be polite. 
Barbara got to her feet and shuffled across the rug, her bare soles making little static pops against the fabric as she led into the adjacent bedroom. It was a small room, and Lyra could tell that it was intended to be more of a mudroom or laundry area. A window was open, frilled white curtains gently drifting in the breeze. She couldn't hear or see the ocean from the room, but Barbara was right. She could smell both the storm and the sea on the air. The bassinet was sitting against the wall underneath the window. It was empty and looked like it had never been used. The sheets were flawlessly white and crisp, a mobile above with plush wells and clouds slowly circled, the occasional chime of its music faintly triggering in the breeze. What time did you lay him down? Lyra asked, slowly making her way around the room, looking for any signs that something had happened here. Probably 10.30. She hadn't called Lyra until 2.30. That was a suspiciously long nap for a baby, wasn't it? Lyra didn't have kids, didn't want kids, so she really wasn't sure about their normal sleeping habits. What time did you notice he was gone? When you called me? Yes, but I checked on him just after noon. He was still sleeping. And you're sure he was still here? Positive. I... She choked up, putting her fingers against her lips. I put my hand on his little chest to make sure he was breathing. Sometimes I can't tell, you know? Lyra didn't know, but she nodded. She took a deep breath. What are your plans for the storm? Well, I was going to go to my mom's, but I can't go anywhere until we find Liam. I just can't leave him here. Okay, just hang tight. Don't go anywhere. Do you understand? I want to be able to find you if I need you. I'm going to walk around the house, look outside the window. Landon will be back to get me in just a few and we'll start combing the town, all right? She nodded eagerly, wiping her eyes. You'll find him, won't you? Yes, we will. Of course, the real unknown was dead or alive. The small island and the baby was unlike, this was a small island and the baby was likely still in the house. If someone had really kidnapped him, they were on the island somewhere. Lyra is working with so little and she was running out of time to even begin a search. She put her cell phone to her ear as she crossed the threshold and began walking around the back of Barbara's house. Landon didn't answer and the call went to voicemail. She paused with the phone in her hand as she approached the window to the nursery. Her brow furrowed as she, and she slowed her steps, walking almost as though she were trying to sneak up on the evidence that she saw there. The siding of the house was wet and mildewed, leaving a long trail of black slime from the windowsill to the ground. As her eyes traveled downward, she noticed the ground there was also saturated, nearly black with moisture, and there were two large footprints, most certainly belonging to a man who had stood there long enough to sink slightly into the sandy soil. Chapter 3. Landon Landon knocked on the back door of the funeral home in quick, repetitive motions. On the other side of the door, he could hear a man's voice yell a string of curses. Landon loved to annoy Chris Maloney. Near his feet, a cat's head appeared from inside, poking through the cat door. His fat orange head rotated like an owl's green eyes peering up at Landon as he trilled. Get back in here, you piece of shit. A voice snapped from the opposite side of the door, and the cat retreated back inside with a growl. Landon stifled, Landon stifled a laugh as the door swung open. I have sound effects. <laughs> and Chris stood on the opposite side of the door with sweat pouring down his bald scalp. He looked like he had been working out in a sauna. Despite his gruff demeanor and his potty mouth, his eyes were kind and soft. Am I interrupting something? Landon snarked with a smile. Chris scrunched up his face, tight and sun-worn skin wrinkling around the edges of his eyes and mouth as he chided. Isn't this how we're, is this how we're transporting bodies now? On the back of some damn four-wheeler? It's not a four-wheeler. It's a, shut your fucking mouth and come help me, Chris interjected, his large form pushing past Landon's much slimmer frame. Landon stumbled backwards, heel striking two metal cans with a clatter. He adjusted his pants and strode after the larger man. Chris probably could have carried the dead man in alone. He was both twice Landon's height and weight. They hauled the man inside and laid him near the refrigeration unit on a table. Chris put on a gown and a pair of gloves, reaching down to grasp the zipper of the body bag. He paused, looking up. Let's take a look, shall we? Landon wiggled his eyebrows at him, and Chris jerked the zipper open to reveal the corpse. The fishy aroma of stagnant seawater and decaying flesh filled the room. Landon put his finger underneath his nose, but Chris didn't react at all. Huh. Huh, what? Landon inquired, leaning over. Nothing, just, just a little strange. He reached into the collar of his shirt to retrieve a dangling pair of glasses, putting the comically small lenses onto his nose as he looked down through them at the body in the bag. Does Lyra want me to do the autopsy? Yeah, I think so, but she said you could just hang on to him until after the storm. I can work on it today, he insisted, pulling his sleeve up to check his watch. I don't have any help. Josephine's already gone mainland, but I can stay if I need to. It's it's really no rush. We have a lot of other shit going on, so he can just wait until you're back. Other shit? Chris asked, quirking a brow as he retrieved a clipboard with paperwork and handed it to him. Yeah, apparently. Well, maybe. I haven't talked to Lyra, so I don't know for sure, but I'm not asking for a lifelong commitment. Spit it out. 
Barbara Todd's baby might be missing. Chris studied him for a few moments, then sighed. She may have had some kind of psychosis, a break. You know, I've worried about her for a long time. Everyone has, Landon agreed quietly. He didn't think Barbara would do anything to hurt the baby. He couldn't imagine any kind of psychosis that would send her so far over the edge. I just don't think she had hurt it. Do you? Babies don't just disappear. Just disappear. Check her closets, cabinets, the garbage can, between the mattress and box springs. I've seen it all. Our brains are, fra are such fragile machines, Landon. Such fragile, fickle prototypes. <clears throat> outstanding, outstanding. Uh, so when does this book come out? Uh, February 9th, and it should be up for pre-order just in the next day or so. Oh, very cool. Uh, send me that link as soon as it's available. Um, I'll, I'll make sure to get it out there along with the uh, the recording. Thank you. All right. All right. So um, up next, we have Joe Scipione. Um, so Joe, um, interestingly, was actually my first impression of Wicked House Publishing. Um, when uh, I uh, actually, uh, when, when Wicked House came across my radar, um, Joe's book was the only uh, book that they had um, had out at the time. And so, um, you know, it, it was funny because I had to make the entire decision based on Mr. Nightmare, um, because that was like the strongest representation that I could that I had. And um, it's a fantastic book. Um, I don't know if you all have checked that one out, but um, it's a great read with, um, you know, really cool premise. And uh, I love any piece that has uh, that, that creates an excuse to tell little micro stories within the larger story. Um, it's always so much fun. And um, it also has a sequel, um, Mr. Nightmare 2, The Nightmare Realm. And uh, today, Joe is going to be reading from his brand new novel, Never Dead, um, which literally just came out yesterday. And um, I'm really excited to hear, from, hear him read from it. So I'm going to go ahead and turn the floor over to Joe Scipione. All right, this is, um, this is the first chapter. Um, the, the story takes place in 1926. So um, I'll just start right in from there. <laughs> The wet ground makes it easy for Clyde to slide the spade of the shovel into the damp earth. It's been raining for most of the day, and even though it is only three in the afternoon, it feels like midnight. You think you can do this any slower, Mr. Creighton says. Standing off to the side, the trench-coated older man supervises the excavation from under a large umbrella. I, I'm sorry, sir. I've, I've never done anything like this, Clyde says. He pulls up the shovel full of slop, and tosses it to the side, adding to the small pile. Dug a hole, Clyde? You've dug plenty of holes before. Now, let's get this over with. I'd rather not have anyone asking questions about all of this. Creighton is right. Clyde had dug holes before, all the time, actually. As head groundskeeper at the Creighton estate, it is his job. Probably the reason Mr. Creighton brought him along, but Clyde wishes he hadn't. He would rather be any other place in the world. Of course, sir. Clyde picks up the pace and tries not to think about the fact that the hole he's digging isn't one in which the tree will be planted or a large boulder pulled out. Those holes are easy to dig. This hole is different. Under the dirt, six feet under, is a body. Clyde doesn't know what Creighton plans to do with the body, and he isn't planning on asking anytime soon. This hole is different. Lightning splinters the sky, and the corresponding thunderclap causes Clyde to flinch between shovelfuls of mud. Creighton remains still, motionless, watching his groundskeeper. The pile of dirt and mud grows, and Clyde finds himself looking up at the grass above him. He tosses another shovelful of the slop up and back over his head, then thrusts the shovel back down into the ground again. It stops penetrating less than an inch with the thunk of metal against wood. I'm there, Mr. Crichton, Clyde calls up. Circumstances were unusual, but he is still a groundskeeper, so he scrapes the shovel back against the wood, the coffin, like he would any time he was digging to uncover something. Crichton peers down over the edge of the hole. A smile grows on his lips. He gives a short, quick nod to his employee. Good work, Clyde. Now uncover the rest so we can open it up. Crichton backs away from the hole, presumably so Clyde can continue to throw dirt up over the edge. Open it, sir? We, we need to open it? Clyde asks. 
his shovel scrapes down the sides of the hole, making it wide enough to pull the top off the coffin and get at the body inside. Yes, yes, Clyde. Why would we dig up a grave if not to get the body up? Yes, sir. Of course, sir. Another flash of lightning. Clyde lifts his head, peering out over the edge of the hole. Clyde, my friend, if you keep stopping to watch this storm, we'll never get the body out and we'll never get in from the rain. Please, just keep working so we can get back inside. Clyde lifts the shovel without a word and resumes his work. The top of the coffin is cleaned off, and Clyde begins work on the sides of the hole, scraping the damp earth down onto the wood that now supports his own weight. He scoops the dirt off the top and adds it to the pile above. Lightning and thunder continue around him, and the wind picks up, causing Creighton to struggle with his umbrella. Clayton only notices this because Creighton never seems to struggle with anything. Clyde has been working for Creighton for 15 years. And although communication between the two men is limited, Clyde feels he knows the man better than most. He understands Creighton's schedule, keeps the grounds just the way his boss likes them. In 15 years, he's never seen Creighton upset. He's never seen something go the opposite of what Creighton expects. The man always gets his way. So, when the storm doesn't cooperate by tugging gently on Creighton's umbrella, Clyde notices. Clyde tries to maintain his composure. Creighton tries to maintain his composure, but Clyde sees the frustration under the facade. Clyde gives the sides of the hole one final scrape and shovels the dirt out. Then he runs the blade of the shovel along the edge of the coffin, making certain the sides are clear. I think it's all clear, Mr. Creighton, Clyde says, but I don't think I can pull it off by myself. Even if you help, sir. Thunder booms around them, but it is softer than the last rumble. The rain weakens. No need, Clyde. Stay there. Creighton turns, retreats to his car. Cadillac introduced the LaSalle line in 1926, and Creighton, of course, was one of the first men in the country to own one. Creighton fumbles around inside the car and emerges moments later, carrying a rope with a hook attached to one end. He tosses the rope down. Clyde looks up at him. Attach that hook to the top of the casket. Just the top of the casket, not the whole thing. I don't want to pull the whole thing out. Just the top. Then we can get the body. Yes, sir. Sir, what, what are we going to do with the body? Clyde asks, regretting his question as soon as the words escape his lips. One step at a time, Clyde. One step at a time. Creighton grins. Clyde sees a twinkle in his eye. He's never seen a look like that on Creighton's face. It is unnerving. Terrifying. But he can't think about what Creighton is going to do with the body. His employer expects work to get done, and Clyde prides himself on being a good worker. Because of that, he will get the job done. The rain is lighter than before, but still pours down around Clyde. The water drips off his head, down his forehead, and into his eyes. It doesn't slow him down. With the sky brightening and the prospect of precipitation ceasing, Clyde focuses on his work and is able to pry the lid of the coffin up just enough to get the hook in under the outside edge. It's on, sir, Clyde calls from the hole. Climb out of there, Clyde. Clyde pulls himself out, back onto the damp grass. As he gets to his feet, he looks up to see Creighton attaching the rope to the front end of the Cadillac. His box, boss affixes the rope to the car and climbs in. The engine roars to life, and then it backs up slowly. The top of the coffin is pulled easily up onto the grass. Pull it out of the way, Creighton calls from the car, seemingly content to give orders from the dry car until he's needed outside again. Clyde does what he always does listens to his boss. He kneels in the cold rainwater in the damp grass. Clyde unhooks the rope from the thick piece of heavy oak. With the top of the casket free, Clyde grips the wood with both hands. Though it's heavy, he drags it away from the open gravesite and looks to his boss. Excellent, Clyde, good work. Now, get that rope wrapped around its legs, Creighton barks from the driver's seat. Sir, Clayton's Clyde stands for a moment, frozen. 
The last thing he wants to do is get back in the hole with that body. Now, Clyde, let's hurry. Peyton shifts his gaze skyward. Clyde's shoulders slump. He doesn't mean to do it. He would never do it intentionally in front of his boss, even if he hated the task given to him. He always says, yes, sir, and gets to work. He is paid to do what is asked of him and never complain. Clyde, you can do this. It's almost done. Creighton surprises him by giving him words of encouragement. Yes, sir. He climbs into the hole, stands on the narrow edge of the casket, straddles the legs of the body so as not to touch it. The smell of death overwhelms him. He coughs and gags before setting to work. In his line of work, a dead animal here or there is nothing new. The smell of death is familiar. Dead birds killed by a cat or a wild dog left somewhere on the grounds or a nest of rats or mice within the walls of one of the sheds, or even along the outside walls of the Creighton house itself. No, the odor is not new, but the intensity of the smell as it invades his nostrils and embeds itself within his head is more potent than a single dead animal or a ne nest of small ones. The contained and then released stench of a human body is much different. Clyde has yet to look at the man's face, but the shoes are shiny and clean. The man's suit is dripping wet, but otherwise looks new. Careful to touch only the man's shoes, Clyde wraps the rope around the ankles and then hooks the rope back onto itself. He gives it one quick tug, tightening everything. Confident the rope will stay and the inevitable happens, Clyde climbs out of the hole, steps away, and gives Creighton a wave. As he does this, he gives a long, hard suck of clean air and expels it, ridding himself of the deathly air below. Creighton wastes little time and backs the car up. He rolls the car slow this time, even slower than before. Clyde assumes so as not to damage the body he's about to pull up from what was supposed to be its final resting place. The body lifts out of the hole and then slides back along the slick grass. Once the body is completely out, Creighton stops the car gets out and swings open the back door. The sky is brighter and the rain slows to a light mist. Creighton forgoes the umbrella and walks to where Clyde stands dumbfounded, unsure of what to make of the events transpiring. He feels more like an observer in all this, not a participant. Get over here, Clyde. We're almost done for today. Clyde joins Creighton and the body. He knows what's coming and he doesn't want to believe it. Can't believe it. Take his arms, Clyde. Let's get him in the back seat. We still have to fill the hole back in. Clyde stares off, his face flat. He blinks, Creighton's words repeating in his head. He stands by the man's head, still refusing to look at the pale face on the former human. He reaches down and takes the body under the armpits. Creighton, doing actual work for the first time Clyde can remember, picks up the legs and they carry him to the car. Go through the back. Just be careful of the tire when you climb in. Clyde nods and backs in through the open back door, pulling the body with him. He strains and looks up, seeing Creighton not working as hard as he is. But Clyde's not surprised he's doing the bulk of the work. The body pins Clyde up against the opposite door. With nowhere else to go, the groundskeeper reaches behind him and opens the door. When the door opens, Clyde begins to fall backward, but catches himself on the wet ground with his foot. The dead man begins to fall out as well, but Clyde stops the body's fall by clutching the man's cold, dead hand and pushing it, pushing his arm back into the car. Once he's certain the body is in, he slams the door shut. Creighton shuts the door on the opposite side at the same time. The body is in the car. There, Clyde, not so bad, right? The hard part, as they say, is over. Creighton laughs. Clyde, again, just nods. Without a word, Clyde returns to the top of the casket. Gripping the slippery wood with two hands, he drags it across the grass and lets it fall into the hole. It won't be hard to tell someone was here method messing with this grave, Clyde. Peyton picks up his umbrella, shakes it off. But they might not realize we took a body if we fill it back up. Let's go. I'll give you a glass of the good bourbon when we get back. After you clean yourself up, of course. Clyde picks up the shovel and slides the tool back into the wet dirt. He just finished digging. 
when the hole is full, they go to the car and leave St. Patrick's Cemetery. Outstanding, outstanding. Uh, I got to say, I, I I love Clyde as a character. Um, he's definitely uh, definitely a very very compelling read. So thank you. All right, all right. Well, thank you very much. Um, absolutely. And uh, again, this uh, you know, um, Never Dead did just come out yesterday. So if you go ahead and order it now, you can be among the first folk to uh, to to own and read it. So which is really exciting. All right, all right. So. I'm going to go ahead and uh, turn uh, uh, introduce our final reader, uh, Jay Bauer. Um, so I first came across Jay's work as a result, honestly, of his excellent covers. Um, one book that had stood out to me was um, Hanging Corpses. It's just um, it's such a, a, a gripping image right from the beginning. It's one of those where you pick it up and you can just, yeah, I mean, how do you not want to know what's inside of it? Um, but uh, I also had the opportunity this summer to read um, the absolutely fabulous um, metal themed novel of Cadaverous, which um, is what Jay is going to be reading to us uh, from today. So um, without further ado, um, I will turn the mic over to Jay Bauer and Cadaverous. Thank you. I really appreciate that. So I will start off by saying I am not a professional reader and within uh, probably the next week, uh, Joe Hempel himself will actually start working on Cadavers. He's going to be narrating this for me. So if you want to hear a really good version of it, um, just just uh, be patient because it's coming, I promise you. Um, so I'm going to be reading the introduction and the first two chapters of my book, Cadaverous. <clears throat> introduction. Cadaverous was a heavy metal band that came to sudden prominence in 2018. They skyrocketed to fame on the back of several bizarre events that resulted in the deaths of at least five known victims, though the actual account is likely much higher. The account that follows is taken from the handwritten journal of the band's frontman and founding member, Gage Penrod. It appears that he intended on writing a series of blog posts, though instead of posting them online, he kept them in his journal. It's unclear why he never shared these publicly. A thorough online search did not return any results. Where at all possible, I tried to verify the facts. My team of graduate assistants were invaluable in this endeavor. However, the posts, as crafted by Mr. Penrod, contained a fair number of unsubstantiated claims. In an effort to present the case with as much evidence as possible, I left those in the text. I hope it may stir intellectual debate and further inquiry. Regardless of the validity of the details, the fact remains that at least five people lost their lives because of Mr. Penrod's vile beliefs. A word of warning to the reader. The incantation Mr. Penrod speaks of in his writing cannot in any way be verified as legitimate. I have not tried reciting it myself, but in my research, there are mentions of others who attest to its power. I include it, as I did with everything else, in an attempt at transparency. These types of occurrences must be shown in their entirety if we are ever to understand their hold on individuals. However, there are certain things better left alone, and I caution the reader to not delve into the darkness. There are powers there which are far more sinister than you can ever imagine. Dr. Leonard Spivey, PhD, Associate Professor of Occult Studies, University of Northern Michigan, Department of Religion. Chapter 1, The Cadaver's Blog, Post 1. We never realize we're at a turning point in life until it's too late. For me, that was August 21st, 2017. I remember it vividly. The day was hot and sticky. My older sister, Hannah, and her boyfriend, Buck, took me to the Eclipse concert at Williams Farms. The concert was to celebrate that Carbondale was the point of longest duration of the Eclipse, a fact I cared little about. Others did, though, and that's why the weekend-long festival was created. All that mattered to me was that Ozzy Osbourne was going to play live. Williams Farms was a new winery trying to break into the Southern Illinois wine trail, and this was the big event that they thought would put them on the map. They cleared a field lined with trees and added several temporary shacks for food and vendors. And Buck wasn't my sister's boyfriend's real name, but after I once called him Ronald, he crashed his fist into my stomach and scolded me saying, you little turd, don't ever call me by that name again. That was close to a year before the concert when I was 16. Hannah never stood up for me, even when he continued to harass me. 
Buck and I had an understanding since then. I accepted the possibility the concert would suck because of Buck being there, but I had to see Ozzy. He was scheduled to sing Bark at the Moon when the eclipse started. It was all planned out, and legends like him rarely ever visited our part of rural southern Illinois. The crowd was thinner than expected. I don't know if it was because of the location or the heat or something else. I heard afterward that the organizers lost a ton of money and the one in charge lost their job. At the moment, I didn't know any of that, nor would I have cared. It was all about seeing Ozzy live. The dude was getting old, too, so this might have been my last chance to see him. My black t-shirt was soaked through. The humidity was so thick. Being out in the field with several hundred others only made it worse. They had water sprinkler stations and handed out bottled water, but it didn't help much. Gage, why don't you see if her friends are here? My sister asked, gently shoving me away from her and Buck like I was something to be cast aside. Buck glared at me, and I kept my mouth shut. They drifted toward the right side of the field, and I kept my distance. I didn't mind hanging out by myself. My friends didn't come to the show because of the outrageous ticket prices. I was lucky my dad overcompensated for not being around much after he and mom divorced, one of the only things he was ever good for. I had no use for him otherwise. Around 1.15 in the afternoon, Ozzy slowly ambled to the microphone on the stage. He spoke to the crowd, trying to bring up the energy which had been sapped by the sun. The moon had already begun to cast a shadow on the land in the anticipation built. Then at 121, the moon completely blocked out the sun and Ozzy started singing. The hairs on the back of my neck stood on end. An electric current raced through the crowd as they released their pent-up energy while singing with the Prince of Darkness. The temperature dropped. A halo of sunlight danced around the edges of the moon. Ozzy sounded spectacular. The band was in total sync with him. When he ambled to the left, they leaned that way. When he hit a high note, the guitar player jumped in the air. Smoke rose from machines on either side of the stage. Ozzy's presence was everything I wanted to be in my band. The way he commanded the audience was stunning. People leaned toward him when he reached his hand out to them. Even at his age, he was the man. The crowd sang along and I joined in, belting out my best impression of him. At one point, I glanced toward my sister and Buck, and he'd ripped her shirt off, exposing her small breasts. I shook my head and felt a tiny urge to vomit. Hannah didn't seem to mind, her entire being given over to the powerful performance from Ozzy. She raised her arms and sang. Buck alternated between staring at her exposed chest and Ozzy on the stage. I turned away from them. My cheeks felt hot. I really hope none of my friends were there to see the awful spectacle they were making. In my sun-baked vision, I realized there was something else on the stage. A black shadow. I blinked several times to make sure I wasn't hallucinating. It morphed into an almost human-like shape and seemed to follow Ozzy everywhere he went. A lump caught in my throat. Maybe it wasn't really there, like my mind had fried and the heat was making it up. But there it was, behind him. A knot of fear worked its way up my spine. Then, as the song neared the end and the moon shifted from the sun, thin tendrils of blackness spiraled outward from the thing toward the crowd. It was like thousands of shadowy umbilical cords raced out from its chest in a matter of seconds to leech onto the writhing mass of people. None of them seemed to notice the thing connecting to all of them, and one thick tendril snaked through the crowd, and before I knew it, I looked down and it latched onto my chest. A flood of dark emotions filled me. I opened my mouth to scream, but I couldn't. A jolt of fear raced through me. Ozzy's performance grew more powerful. His presence on the stage was more pronounced, like an otherworldly spotlight cast a darkened glow around him. I froze in place, unsure what I should do with the tendril connected to me. As the song ended, so did the glow around Ozzy. All the tendrils snapped back to the black shadow thing, and it vanished. I stood with my mouth open. The crowd screamed for more, and Ozzy was more than eager to offer it. What the hell had I seen? What did it do to me? Was I losing my mind? Someone else had to have seen it. I didn't drink or do any drugs, and almost everyone around me at the concert did, but that wasn't for me. It never had been. But maybe it was a contact buzz or something like that. I worked my way out of the crowd toward one sprinkler. My body felt sickly, like the sun had burned into my soul. I got under the tepid water and hoped I wasn't going to black out. 
My thoughts spun as I tried to make sense of what I'd seen. The rest of the concert was a blur. When Hannah, with her shirt back on, thankfully, and Buck were ready to go, they found me nearly passed out leaning against an oak tree. I barely remember Buck slinging me over his shoulder and complaining about it. My mind was far away. I replayed the moment Ozzy took the stage and the creeping dread it evoked within me. What was that thing, and why did it reach out to the crowd like that? I didn't think it really touched me, but maybe it did. I, I really couldn't tell. That night, when I was in my bedroom listening to a playlist of Ozzy's songs, I couldn't get the experience out of my head. It both intrigued me and frightened me. It must have been a part of the show, like a prop or something. He always had some kind of messed up act he included with the concert. I mean, he bit the head off of a freaking bat once. More than anything, though, I wanted to play music. The show lit a fire within me. I wanted to get together with my band. It had been far too long since we played, and with my senior year of high school starting, it might be the last chance we got for a while. I made plans to reach out to the band. I wanted to get us back together. Chapter 2, The Cadaver's Blog, Post 2. Nobody really creates a blog anymore. I get that but I needed an outlet to explain what happened. These words will live on. They will always be there, even if I'm not. And you'll understand what I mean. The day after the concert, I still couldn't stop thinking about it. The eclipse, the people, Ozzy, the whatever the hell it was I saw on the stage. I hadn't mentioned it to my friends at school. I didn't even text about it to the guys in my band. But I asked Hannah. We were at home the night after the show watching the old Halloween movie the original with the creepy Shatner mask, and Hannah wasn't paying any attention to it. Her head was bent toward her phone, furiously texting Buck. He'd gotten called into work at the burger place on Main Street that night, and she was pouting. Mom was working late, so it was just the two of us. Hannah, can I ask you something about the concert? I asked, as Jamie Lee Curtis screamed on the television. Huh? Yeah, whatever. I paused. Normally, Hannah's pretty cool with listening to my crazy ideas, but somehow this felt like a stretch. I had no idea how she'd react to my question. It honestly felt odd even asking. She glanced up from her phone with a slight scowl on her face. What? Were you going to ask me something? The music from the movie turned dark and pulled her attention from my frozen stare. The corners of her mouth turned down. The only reason she was there with me was because she had nothing else to do. Hannah hated horror movies. Do you remember when Ozzy started singing? I asked. Her cheeks blushed. Yeah, you aren't going to tell mom about that, are you? She turned back to me and a grin had replaced the scowl. What? Oh, no. I realized then she meant when, when Buck pulled her top down. Gross. No, not that. You guys are perverts. Hannah giggled. Buck liked it. Stop being such a prude. Anyway, when Ozzy was singing and the moon crossed in front of the sun, I saw something. Ew, gross. You didn't stare at me, did you? I can't handle a sick old brother. People get locked up for that kind of thing. Hannah, no, not that. I meant from the stage. Do you see anything odd? She clasped her hands in her lap and looked up, searching her memory. Finally, she spoke. Not that I can think of. Ozzy's performance seemed pretty normal to me. Maybe a bit more powerful than I expected, but nothing I'd call unusual. Nothing? I whispered. Maybe I made it up. I checked reports of the show afterward, and not a single person mentioned the black tendrils that extended from the thing on the stage. It was like it never happened. Did you see something? Were you on something? Hannah asked. She giggled again. Gage Penrod, you freak. Damn it, Hannah. No. Forget I mentioned it. I focused on the movie, but my thoughts went back to the stage. Something happened, and it wasn't a prop. The more I thought about it, the more I convinced myself it was real. I let the subject drop and ignored Hannah's giggles as she typed something in a buck. I imagined she was making fun of me. The next day at school, I met up with my best friend, Landon Burleson, in the parking lot before our first class. We'd known each other since grade school when his family moved to town. Landon was a month younger than me, and as an only child, he always had the best and latest. He scored an Xbox One Day One edition two days before release because his dad pulled some strings. He was also the lead guitar player of our band and the only one of us to ever actually take lessons. Unlike the rest of us, his hair was cut short like he was prepping for a business interview. 
He said it was easier to deal with. Landon approached with a cigarette hanging out of his mouth. He smoked marble reds like he was some damn cowboy or something. Of all the things he could have as a vice, he chose the one most likely to piss off his parents. I shook my head. What's up? I asked. Landon blew out a puff of smoke. Have you thought about vaping instead? I asked. Those things blow up. But they smell better and won't give you cancer. Shit, man. Even water will give you cancer. At least I can enjoy the ride until I die. I couldn't argue against that logic. How long has it been since we had the band together? I asked. Landon took a drag from the cigarette and blew it to the side. Too damn long. Why, you got something in mind? I ran a hand through my long brown hair. Yeah, man. The pumpkin festival. A sly smile raced across Landon's face. The talent show? I nodded. Every year in Brownsville, there's a fall festival to celebrate the harvest season. Rumor had it that 50 years ago, nearby farmers used to grow tons of pumpkins and ship them all over the Midwest. Honestly, I think there might be only one farmer that actually grows them anymore. Most are shipped in from Missouri. It hadn't stopped the local Chamber of Commerce from holding the event and celebrating Brownsville's rich agricultural history. I couldn't care less about that. I was more interested in the annual talent show held on the Saturday night of the nearly week-long event. And as a band, we discussed it the year before, but never could settle on a song. I wanted to cover Master of Puppets from Metallica, a classic. I loved the heavy riffs, and my voice was pretty close to James Hetfield's. Landian preferred something newer from Lamb of God. I didn't like that at all. I'd be good for that one song, and my throat would hurt so bad I couldn't talk. I'd need a ton of practice to pull it off. I have no idea how Randy Blythe sings like that. Our bass player Mitch had no opinion, and our drummer Nick suggested we play to the crowd and do some old Bon Jovi crap. By the time we settled on My Hero from the Foo Fighters, we only had a couple of days until the talent show, and none of us felt good enough about our version of the song to climb up on stage in front of the town. We continued to practice for another few months, but that was slowed and but that slowed until February when we stopped playing altogether. It's not like we stopped hanging around each other. It was just that playing music didn't hold as much interest for most of us. I was always itching to get together, and I sat in my room and practiced songs all the time. And I needed to get the band together, especially after seeing Ozzy. I had a fire burning deep inside, and there was only one way to release it. Yeah, man, why not? We've got time. Hell, we can even do that Foo Fighters song we were going to do last year. What do you say? I didn't held his cigarette in his hand, the long ash threatening to fall off. Have you talked to the other guys? Not yet. I wanted to start with you. He nodded. I took that as an affirmative. This weekend, we can practice at my place like old times, I said. Only if everyone else is on board. I don't want a shit show like last year. Dude, come on. We got this. Landon dropped the cigarette and crushed it underfoot. Time for class. I'll see you. He turned and sauntered away. Inside, I was giddy. We were about to start something amazing. Or so I thought. What we were about to do was far more sinister than anything Ozzy could have dared to dream of. All right. Fantastic. Fantastic. Um, so uh, first off, thank you. Thank you to the three of you for reading such outstanding work. Um, so for the uh, Q&A portion, no matter what, I've got a quite a couple questions for you. And um, also everybody else will be invited to join in as well. I did want to lead it off with one question direct directed at all three of you, which is um, what drew you to horror? And when did you know you had a horror story to tell? Um, oh, first, yeah, I guess. Um, so I read a, like a ton of horror growing up. I um, I was a little bit too old for Goosebumps, so I read John Belair's when I was in uh, like elementary school, and then I started reading Stephen King way too young, um, and uh, I read it when I was in fifth grade. So um, that'll do it. Didn't really understand a lot of it, but that's where I started. And then uh, the more I read, um, kind of the more I was like, well, I think. I have a story I want to tell. I don't know what it is, but I always was drawn to, to writing and, and making up stories or creating stories in my head. Um, and then when I wrote more in college, from there, I kind of was like, oh, this is something I could do. 
um, I have a history degree, so I wrote like a ton of history papers and I realized there's something I could do. Um, like I really like to write. Um, and so I gravitated more towards history at first and then fiction after that. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, Megan, how about you? Uh, I've, I've always liked horror. Me and my sister used to rent uh, VHS types at a local video store, you know, and so we had our go-tos and that's just what we were always drawn to. Um, and then I really liked as far as like writing, um, my first loves were, were horror and fantasy. Um, but I really liked Edgar Allan Poe and I would read some of his short stories. Uh, like the black cat was one of my favorites. And then I would retell it like to like my sister and I would always put my own spin on it. So she wouldn't expect the ending because she had heard it before. And so I would just kind of change it up and I liked doing that. And then when I realized I could just kind of start from scratch and do my whole entire story on my own, you know, that was, that was just kind of it. Out of curiosity, do you have a Stephen King book that you read too young? Oh yeah. Actually, ironically, my first Stephen King book was Dreamcatcher, which is random, but like I bought it at Walmart when they still had like kind of a big book section, you know, over by checkout. I just picked it up because I liked the cover and that was that was my first Stephen King book. Well, that's an unusual first choice. Uh, yeah. All right, how about you, Jay? I, I would like to start off by saying, Joe, you and I are going to have to be best friends, my friend. Um, I, too, have a history degree. Actually, I have two of them. Um, <laughs> Me, too. I've, I've got my, my master's is in early medieval history. Um, so I, I don't see too many history folk out in the wild, and I get really excited when I find others out there. Awesome. <laughs> um so yeah uh so i've always kind of been into into horror my mom um i'll blame her uh she was um a big and still is a, a real big stephen king fan and always had books around the house and so all of us having our, our stephen king moment um my first book that i ever read on my own that i uh just out of enjoyment was pet cemetery um, it was sitting there on the, the coffee table. And I was like, this looks kind of cool. And I started reading it. And I was like, oh, my gosh, this is it. Um, but I used to watch all those real bad, like 80s horror movies and stuff. And I was I grew up on that stuff. And like <laughs> Megan said, you know, renting those VHS. I was that was me growing up. You know, I did all of that. Um, and then um, I I didn't really think about doing any kind of writing necessarily in high school. Um, it was actually my first semester of college, which, um, as I tell students now, um, was a terrible semester. I, I actually was on probation after that semester. <laughs> um, but uh, in English class, you had to do this this uh, uh, exercise about like, what did you do over the summer kind of thing? You know, the, this basic uh, uh, assignment. And I did it through the eyes of my best friend, whose girlfriend had broke up with him right after we graduated high school. So he had this whole like depression all summer long, but it was a view of me through his eyes. And that's when I first knew I was like, oh, I can write something like because it, it went over really well, you know, and it was just a very, a very creative way of doing it. But uh, that I didn't do anything, <laughs> any writing for another 10, 12 years or so, maybe even longer. Um, it took me a while before I actually did. Um, and I started writing some short stories. Um, and then NaNoWriMo is what actually got me into writing a novel for the first time. Um, and it, that novel, um, my very first win at NaNo um, has gone through several versions, but that actually has become my book, Master of Demons. Um, and actually, several of my books started as NaNo novels, but that was my very first one I ever wrote. And it was crap. And it took me a very long time to get it right. Uh, but I think... My book, uh, Mr. Nightmare, was a NaNoWriMo book also. Nice. <laughs> Best friends, I'm telling you, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, one thing I feel bad for current generations is that they will never know the joy of the uh, trip to the video store. Um that's one thing that uh, like my whole childhood revolved around that particular experience. And so, um, yeah, just the, the the process of sifting through titles. It's actually one thing that gave me a tremendous respect for the back covers of things. Um, so I, I, I did want to ask each one of you a specific question. Um, to some extent, you've already, um, I, I think, offered some hints at answers. Um, I was going to start with with you, Joe. Um, so. 
one thing that strikes me about Never Dead, of course, is, um, you know, it's it's definitely got a really cool retro horror feel to it. Um, you know, it, it it reminded me a lot of numerous classics, not just you know, like the obvious, of course, is Frankenstein. Um, but it also has a bit of the, the Faustian compact to it. Um, you know, it also has sort of the, the Gothic vibe, I think, in, pl in, in, in places as well. It reminds me of some of the really classic um, horror films, especially with um, the Creighton estate and the general setting built out of it. Um, so uh, what I wanted to ask is, um, what drew you to the 1920s as a major setting for this piece? Why that specific decade? Uh, so going back to all, all my history um, studies, I had taken a course um, getting my master's in, in 1920s history. Um, and I just we had read so much about like daily life and, and stuff that was going on during the 1920s. And I just always thought that that was like a really interesting time period where I don't see a whole lot of, um, of horror books set in that. And I was like, well, that would be a really interesting time period to put, to put a book in because I know a lot about it. I haven't read a whole lot of stuff that takes place during that time. Um, and I just thought it would be interesting to put it there. Very cool, very cool. And uh, in the chat, we have an excellent question from Candace Nola. Um, she she writes, Jay, I know you also write fantasy. Do you write in any other genres? And for Joe and Megan, do you either of you plan to try any other genre as you go along, or is it horror for you? Um, so I'll I'll start. Um, yeah, Candace Candace knows. Um, actually, I write under two different names, but um, I've got um, I four book fantasy series, a three book portal fantasy series, a three book YA sci-fi trilogy that's out and um, two books of a, like a game lit lit RPG series that I had written. Um, what and, name are those under? Uh, <laughs> um, I, I don't always, well, one of, um, yeah. Um, <laughs> It's uh, it's Jason is actually my first name, um, and uh, yeah, I'll, <laughs> I'll leave it for that right now. So I haven't told many of my readers um, about all of that, and, and the fantasy side of it, uh, kind of going with Joe and the history thing. Um, I was not a big fantasy reader growing up, um, <laughs> but I do enjoy that kind of. <laughs> uh, I do enjoy a lot of that, but. Um, and so it was more of out, of out of my medieval history side that I wanted to write fantasy is the reason why I did it. Um, my love has always been horror. I can talk to you horror till you're blue in the face and I, I can go the ins and outs of it. I can't tell you that about fantasy or sci-fi. Um, you know, the sci-fi trilogy was, um, it was a labor of love. If you love, if you will, something I wanted to write for my son, um, a story that he would write because he, uh, used to read a lot and, and discover video games and that went out the door. And so <laughs> that's where that series had come from. So a lot of different things. Um, but uh, I don't plan on continuing writing that any, I don't see it in the future. I'll say that. I don't have any books planned um, on that side of things for quite a while, if at all. Um, Cause I've, I'm with my people and I love it. And <laughs> that's kind of where I want to spend my time and energy. And thanks, Candice. Um, I like she says, keep your secrets. Uh, she knows. Actually, Megan knows too. Um, uh, but Candace knows. And uh, thanks, Candice. I appreciate that. Uh, Joe and Megan. I can go next, I guess. <laughs> um, I actually have an unpublished three book fantasy series that me and my editor just don't know if we can mark it or not <laughs> um so I, because i i love fantasy but everything else i write is just kind of uh i call it horror infused or horror adjacent so even if it's not pure horror it still has those elements and that's probably what 90 percent of what i put out will be like i think we all got stuff that um is unpublished i have a a big kind of big uh, science fiction, uh, military science fiction book 
uh, that I wrote. It's I don't know if it'll ever be published. It definitely needs like a lot of work. Um, I probably different than most people. I was not a big horror movie guy. I read a lot of horror books, but I didn't um, watch many horror movies. I was like a lot of science fiction movies. I'm a big Star Trek fan, so uh, so that that book is definitely Star Trekky. Um, I don't know if it'll ever see the light of day, but yes, I've written science fiction stuff. So you can't mention being a Star Trek fan without at least telling us which of your favorite series is. Oh, it's so hard right now. I really like that Picard series. Um, and then I, I like The Next Generation overall, too. All right. All right. Um, of course, uh, you know, if you do have questions, um, go ahead, put them in the chat. Like I said, I have a, a couple specific ones. Um, I did want to ask uh, Megan. Um, so, you know, um, I am new to Lovely, Dark and Deep, besides from the cover and the very, uh, you know, the, 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 the little blurb that you, you, you presented uh, publicly. So um, I was wondering, of course, we have a pretty pretty dark and brooding opening, I think. Um, but beyond that, what kind of horror would we expect from this book? Um, this is kind of um, my spin on a vampire novel. Um, but there, it's like vampire sirens, you know, that kind of thing. So um, in my little like uh, synopsis slash blurb, I say it's kind of like uh, if 30 days of night were on an island during a storm versus, you know, uh, so yeah, that's that's more of what's going on. Very cool, very cool. Um, and for uh, for Jay, um, I was actually really curious. Um, you know, you really definitely get into um, metal and uh, you know metal performance. You mentioned before, um, you know, uh, the Eclipse show with Ozzy and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So you know, you definitely. Um, you know, at least read about shows. I'm sure you, I have a hunch you've probably been to a good number of them. Um, are you a big metal fan? Um, is that something that's, uh, you know, is music something really important to you? Yeah. Um, you know, not in, in the music that I describe in the book, uh, Cadaverous, you know, it's, you know, these guys are in like 2017, right? But they play all this like 80s, 90s kind of heavy metal, right? That's the stuff I grew up on. That's the stuff I like. Um, and so, uh, I actually created a, a Spotify playlist of every song that I mentioned in that book. It's at the very back of the book. There's a link in the ebook. And then on the paperback, there's a QR code. You could scan it and get that, that Spotify playlist of all those songs. Um, so it's a lot of, a lot of fun, but um, yeah, I, you know, when I was in college, uh, I uh, actually was originally going to go into radio and television. I love music. I can't play a single instrument. I can't sing. But I thought playing it on air would be the coolest job. And so I actually I was leaning toward that. And then I ended up in a ancient civilizations course. And it was so good. And it was so close to the time period in history that I liked that. That changed everything. And I went that direction instead. Uh, but yeah, I, I love music. I, I grew up on that stuff. You know, um, Anthrax was always one of my favorite bands. Uh, Anthrax, Suicidal Tendencies, Metallica, you know, the, all that stuff growing up um, was some of my favorite stuff. A lot of good stuff back there. I couldn't help but thinking of like Sepultura and Fear Factory yeah. and stuff like that while I was reading it. So, um, yeah. all right, all right. So we have a, a question here from S, uh, from Sean Flynn. Um, it, it's targeted towards Joe, but I'm actually also going to add in a little generalization to the the to the the three of you. Um, so uh, the question reads: Never dead has present tense narration. How did you decide on that? Um, I dig it and don't see it often. And then I'll generalize that to say, um, how did y'all settle in on the points of view for, um, you know, Cadaverous, for um, Lovely, Dark and Deep as well? Joe? Um, I just had never actually written one, like a whole book in present tense. And I, when I read it, I really like it because I think it's more, there's, I feel like the, there's more action um, when you're reading it in present tense. So. I just, I had started as a short story, um, that first scene I had written and I didn't really know what to do with it. Um, that whole first chapter actually. Um, and then I had, so I had that for a little while and then I kept thinking about Clyde and, and the characters and then the whole book kind of developed from that. And I had started it in present tense and I just continued with it in present tense. Um, 
as I wrote the rest of the book. Uh, Jay? Yeah, sure. So um, when I wrote Cadavers, it's, of course, it's first person, and I wanted to do something kind of like epistolary in style. Um, I, I've never really written a whole novel that way um, in first person. Most of my short stories are first person, and um, I really, I, I do that on purpose on short stories because that puts you right into the action immediately. Um, and because you have limited space on a short story. So I tend to be first person, but on a novel, I hadn't done that yet. Even though most of my books, I do have a lot of internal thoughts, you know, where you, it is, it switches that first person as that internal thoughts going along. So I wanted to try something different and I couldn't figure out how I wanted to do it. You know, I, I, cause I wanted it to come from a point of view of he's writing this, this, this book is basically, uh, you know, he's looking back at events. Everything has happened as he's writing this. And so I wanted to try to get that point of view of him. You know, it's after the fact that he's writing all of this. And then I couldn't figure out how I wanted to do it. Like, um, you know, as a journal or, a, you know, then the idea of a blog came to me, even though, you know, again, like I just mentioned in, in that chapter too, nobody, nobody really does those anymore. Um, and that was um, intentional uh, on that. And then um the the introduction and um the epilogue that uh, we have from the professor um from the professor of occult studies uh, that kind of bookends this book um that was uh that was later in the process where i came up with that uh, concept to add that to it to try to make it fit a little bit better and i thought it really did kind of give it just that edge it needed to to really seal it all together Right, right, Megan. Um, I'm right mostly in third person past tense. I don't I've written in first person a couple of times, but I've never written in present tense. Uh, that's just what I'm comfortable with. Um the only thing I do a little differently is I I really like alternating points of view. So all right, all right. Um I have I uh, does anyone have any other questions? Give it just a couple of beats. If not, um, I have one last question for the three of you. Um, so, of course, you know, there's uh, uh, one of the biggest challenges, I think, about navigating um, the landscape right now, and really always, is that it can be so difficult to find um you know, I, I, you know, great material to read. It's not that it's not out there, of course, it's just that it can be overwhelming to look at the selection that's before you. So the question's really pretty simple. Um, thinking back over your, uh, you know, your last few months of reading, um, what are a couple of books that um, y'all have found really excited that you think people should go out and read? Well, let me jump in here and give some props to Megan on this. Um, I finally, you mentioned Blue Jay at the beginning of, of this, um, and I, I read that, and absolutely amazing. It is so good, um, and I, I mentioned this to, to Megan. There's a scene in that book that has stuck with me, um, and it's still, it just, it's it's there, you know, and it, it will not go away, and um, I'm not going to spoil that for anybody. She knows what scene I'm talking about. I met, We talked about it. Um, I absolutely loved it. It was just so much fun. Um, it's such a really good, good piece. Um, gosh, uh, I recently read Puzzle House as well. Um, I, I had a lot of fun with that. I love Duncan's style. He's, he's just um, super engaging as, uh, as an author and his writing is just so, um, uh, it just pulls you right in. And I had a lot of fun with that one. Um, I've also read um, everything from John Lynch and John Durgan. I read all of their stuff and Actually, Lynch's new one, I'm going to spoil this, but he sent that to me today. So I'm going to have that um, to read here right now. And I've read, I've heard some of it and I, it's going to be crazy. And I cannot wait um, for this to get out. And I know he's excited about it too. Um, so there's just a lot of different fun stuff, man. Joe? Um, yeah, I, I read um, 
Gothic by Philip Fricasse not too long ago. Um, it just has like that 80s horror vibe to it. Like it feels like it, if you, if you feels like it was published in the 80s. Like I just love that kind of that old school horror um, feel to it. And um, I just thought it was a really good book. And uh, you mentioned John Durgan. His books are really good. I read all his stuff too. Uh, any of his books are good. Megan? Um, I've blurbed a whole bunch of books this year and they were all really exceptional. Um, of course, I, I, Cadaverous was great. Um, really, really loved it. Um, and then the collection that Jay put out with John and John, uh, the Conservators collection was also really good. Um, I've read a whole lot of like uh, single author collections this year, like um, R.J. Benetti's The Upside Down Voice That Speaks Backwards. I really enjoyed it. I really like RJ's work. And then uh, Jonathan Butcher's Something Very Wrong. It was a really excellent, like, uh, extreme horror collection. Um, and then Steam Heat by Caleb Jones. I really enjoyed that. That was really unique. Um, and then Gage Greenwood. I've read uh, Bunker Dogs and On a Clear Day. Uh, and they're both really excellent. Um, and then I read Kelvin V.A. Allison's uh, Beldum of Oz, and it's one of my favorites of his so far. It's been a really good year for books. I could probably go on and on and on. Oh, th this year has been terrible for my book budget. Um, oh, yeah. I, I have gone through way more than I than I should have. And oh, uh, yeah. I, I still have a, 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 a delightful stack waiting for me as soon as uh, semester grades are in. So, yeah, it's uh, it's it's really been an outstanding year. Oh, yeah. Um, and for new authors too, um, Chaz Williams has a book coming out. I think it doesn't come out till next year, but uh, Family Till It Can't Be, Gang Till It Ain't. I read that one too and blurbed it and it's very unique. Um, so it's been, it's just been, a, I feel like it's been a great year for everybody. Bad for the budget, but you know, yeah, good for everybody. No, uh, I'm not going to complain about having too many books to buy. It's exactly. a lot worse when you, you go looking for something to read and you can't find something. Yeah. You know, I definitely agree. It's been a great year for new authors. Um, like I've got uh, a couple of new authors uh, right over here. Like I don't know if uh, y'all have read Ignore the Dead. Um, oh, yeah. I really enjoyed that uh, one, too. I'm actually reading it right now. So, um, yeah, no spoilers on it, but it's a, it's off to a really great start. And then uh, since it is um, coming into the, the holiday season, um, I'll tell folk to read um, Everything is Temporary by John Kahn. Um, he's been an absolute delight to get to know. And um, of course, yeah, he is one of our readers in the next event in the series. Um, so really quickly, um, just to kind of wrap things up, um, we do have uh, a reading next month uh, towards the end. I believe it's January 26th, but I'll have to double check that. But um, it's going to feature John Kahn, uh, Duncan Ralston, and um, also uh, Jeff Strand. Um, I'm really looking forward forward to that event but uh also of course thank you to the three of you um in terms of books that i think people should buy i'm definitely going to say that um as soon as the pre-sale is up lovely dark and deep should be at the top of uh everyone's list as should never dead and of course cadaverous um thank you all for reading thank you all for answering questions and um yeah i um it, it's been great having you all here well, yeah, thank thanks you so for much. having us. Thank you.